there were many clusters, uh, little you know sets of three. Uh, three were dismembered, three were in oil drums, uh, some were in water, some were on land. It's like my own little uh, nightmare scenario. He was one of the most prolific serial killers whose name you may not even know. He killed up to at least 17 women. A holy nightmare on a f stick! What the f is wrong with this man? Bug eye piece of sh nightmare fuel son of a What the anyway um <clears throat> so hello true crimers This is the case of Joel Rifkin viewer discretion Well too late is advised <laughs> You know, I tried to tell this story actually over on TikTok. I had posted a video, but it went into review mode like immediately, which means that TikTok didn't push it out to anyone. Uh, and it just stayed in review mode for hours and hours and hours. And I, for the life of me, couldn't figure out why. I don't know what I said or what images I showed that TikTok was like, nah. It was really weird. It's like one of the only times it's ever happened. So maybe his face is just that alarming. Anyway, Joel David Rifkin was born on January 20th, 1959. His birth parents were college students who just weren't ready for a child. And so a few weeks into his life, Joel was given up for adoption and he was fairly quickly adopted. So his new parents were Bernard and Jean Rifkin. And then they would, I think a couple of years after him, they would adopt another child, a girl. So Joel did have a sibling growing up. By the time he hit kindergarten, uh, they already pretty much discovered that Joel had some learning disabilities. And this really affected his ability to learn, um, even at a very, very young age. He was also kind of an awkward kid growing up. I mean, he sort of, uh, I guess had like the dorkier look, you know, kind of nerdier kid, scrawny, wasn't very athletic. And so throughout school to go along with his learning disabilities, he was picked on a lot. Uh, he was at the, the bad end of bullying for several, several years in school because kids are awful. But back at home, Joel had a very good life. I mean, his, his uh, adoptive parents were very good. They his dad uh, was a very successful person. He made a lot of money. Uh, they were definitely able to provide for the kids. Joel's dad did everything he could to, you know, kind of bond with him. At one point, he tried, you know, teaching him how to throw and catch with footballs and baseballs, but Joel just never caught on, and he was he couldn't catch and he couldn't throw. Uh, and his dad eventually just sort of like, all right, well, maybe sports isn't for you, but that's okay. But he had a good relationship with his sister, he had a good relationship with his parents, but as he got older, as the bullying got worse, as his learning disabilities were causing issues at school, he eventually kind of grew away and he became a little more standoffish with his family, a little more combative, I guess you can say. By high school, Joel tried his best to fit in. He tried joining like the track team just so he could be like, a sports person in school so people wouldn't pick on him as much but it just didn't didn't go well for him he eventually became a member of the yearbook team where he would take photos and he was known as a really good photographer uh, people said he had a, a, a knack for it really talented and it actually just gained him a little bit of respect at school not a lot but some people were a little less mean to him Apparently, his parents had absolutely no idea he was being bullied. Uh, he was, he kept it pretty secret. I can relate. Fast forwarding a little bit to 1987 in February, uh, Joel's father, his adopted father, uh, he had been battling cancer for some time and eventually it was too much for him. And so he took a bunch of pills and he ended his own life. And this kind of mess with Joel a little bit. Joel would kind of revert back a little bit to his, you know, standoffishness. 
And he took to movies, and one particular movie he watched was, I guess, Alfred Hitchcock's Frenzy. And from there, Joel became fascinated with the idea of strangling prostitutes, strangling women. And it became like a sexual gratification type thing. It's something he wanted to do. In late August of 1987, he would actually get involved with, I guess, a prostitution ring, and he was busted by police during an undercover sting, and he would go to jail for a little bit. But by 1989, he was out and about, and he started his own landscaping company. He would uh, just do landscaping around uh, the area. Which, by the way, this is in, like, the Long Island, New York. Um, it's kind of, this sort of happens in New Jersey a little bit. So it's in that neck of the woods. In 1989, he would meet a woman named Heidi Susie Balk. She was a 25-year-old, I believe a sex worker. And he brought her back to the house that he lived in, uh, I believe, with his mother. And... One thing led to another, and he would enact on his urges of strangling a woman, strangling a sex worker, and he strangled, uh, she would go by Susie, he strangled Susie until she was dead. He then just kind of calmly dismembered her body, put her in several bags, and he dispersed her body just in various places in New York. Not too long afterwards, uh, there would be people who would be searching in the kind of New York, New Jersey area, and they discovered Susie's head in a bag. And I don't know if they found her entire body, but they found other parts. And so obviously a murder investigation began, but they didn't really know exactly who she was and they couldn't really retrace her steps, which means they really couldn't find out who she was with. And therefore Joel basically kind of saw this unfolding and realized, oh, I'm getting away with this because they're not going to catch me. They're not going to have any idea I even met this woman. And that gave him, that emboldened him, that gave him more courage to keep doing it, to do it again. So let's fast forward to June 28th, 1993. On Long Island's Southern State Parkway, Joel Rifkin is driving his pickup truck. Well, it's not so much driving as he's fleeing. He is fleeing from cops because he had crashed his truck, I guess, into a pole, did some pretty serious damage. And when cops showed up, he decided to say, oh, shit, and he sped away from it. And so the, the cops were chasing him for some time before eventually the truck just crapped out. And so the cops, you know, kind of, cat, you know, walked up to him with guns like at the ready. And he just sort of put his hands up like this, and they asked him who he was. He said, I'm Joel Rifkin. And one of the officers just kind of smelt something a little strange, a, a bad strange, and it was coming from the back of his truck. Police then lifted the, the back door, and they noticed this big blue tarp. And they lifted the tarp up, and there was this garbage bag underneath it, but there was also hair coming out from it. And so they kind of opened up the trash bag, and it was a, a dead body. The body would eventually be identified as 22-year-old Tiffany Bresciani. Tiffany Bresciani was his final victim. Susie was his first back in 1989. But were there more? There were a lot more. So police arrested him that night, obviously, for the murder. They discovered that he was literally on his way to get rid of this particular body. Um, he had admitted that he killed her four days prior on, on June 24th. Uh, she was also a sex worker that he just picked up, had sex with, and then he killed her, strangled her, and then was going to just hide her body somewhere. He had been using his landscaping business as like a way to, I guess, hide bodies somehow. Well, that night of the arrest, as they're questioning him, he just basically says, yeah, there's 17 victims. He says, I killed se I've killed 17 women. And he says it with no emotion, no remorse, really just, yeah, no, I, I just did it. I killed a bunch of women. So on June 9th, 1994, 
Joel Rifkin would go on trial for the murder of Tiffany Bresciani, as well as endangering the lives of two police officers. And he was convicted of that murder and those crimes. So for that one in particular, he got 25 years to life. The 17 victims that he claimed he killed were 25-year-old Heidi, Susie, Balk, Julie Blackbird, whose body has never been found, 31-year-old Barbara Jacobs. Her body would eventually be found in the Hudson River in 1991. 22-year-old Mary Ellen DeLuca. Her body was found in 1991 in Cornwall, New York. 31-year-old Yun Lee. Her body was found in September of 1991 in the East River off Randall Islands. There was one victim he just identified as number six. He didn't even know her name. She's never been identified and she's also never been found. 28-year-old Lorraine Orvieto. She was found in Coney Island Creek in July of 1992. 39-year-old Marianne Holloman, also found in Coney Island Creek in July of 1992. Then there was a victim he called number nine. Did not know her name either. She was found in May of 1992 in a steel drum, and that was near Brooklyn, floating in Newton Creek. Unfortunately, police have never been able to identify her. Then there was 25-year-old Iris Sanchez, was found in June of 1993, and that was near JFK Airport. 33-year-old Anna Lopez, she was found in Patterson, New York, and that was in May of 1992. 21-year-old Violet O'Neill. She had been dismembered and parts of her body were found in July of 1992 in three different locations. 31-year-old Mary Catherine Williams. She was found in December of 1992 in Yorktown, New York. 23-year-old Jenny Soto. She was found near the Harlem River in November of 1992. 28-year-old Leah Evans. She was found in Northampton, New York and that was in May of 1993. 28-year-old Lauren Marquez, she was found in June of 1993 in the Long Island Central Pine Barrens. And then finally, you have Tiffany Bresciani, who was found in the back of his truck when he was pulled over. He confessed to these 17 women. There is a chance there could be more. Uh, police, they did search his home um, after he was arrested, and they found... Uh, several pieces of jewelry, I mean a bunch of jewelry items that did not belong to his mom or his sister, that and a lot of these jewelry items were confirmed by the family members victims of belonging to, you know, their loved one that was killed. Uh, they also found the driver's license of a few women. They found uh, women's underwear that did not belong to his mother or his sister. They were found in his room. They also found um, bras, they found just uh, lingerie items in his house. His house was uh, a mess. In particular, his room and his garage, they, it was just like a pigsty. There was just shit everywhere. Crap just thrown all over the place. Not literal crap. You know what I mean, stuff. He, he really didn't take much effort in cleaning up, uh, you know, the items he had stolen off of these women. And he really, he kept them as trophies, which is what a lot of serial killers do. He wanted them as mementos. He wanted to look at them and remember what he did uh, because he's a psychopath. And that's what insane serial killers do. He would be asked in a, in a later interview, um, did you ever feel for these women? And he said, you know, when you're doing things like this, you don't think of people as people. You think of these people as just their, as things. He said these women he thought of as just things. He said, you know, when you're doing this, he goes, well, at least for me, you don't think about them having family members. You don't think about them having friends and coworkers and loved ones. You don't think of that. He says he basically convinced himself that these women didn't have anyone in their lives because it made it easier for him. I guess in a way for people to maybe feel for him a little bit, but obviously that's uh, not gonna work. I mean, he said he chose sex workers in particular because no one would really report them, no one would miss them. But that ultimately wasn't true because these women all did have families and maybe not all of them 
were noticed missing, uh, but a lot of them did have families that realized they were missing. And, you know, so he it didn't really account for that. He was asked, you know, why did you do it? And he said, I don't know. He said, I don't know why I, I did the things I did. He can say why he killed specific women. He said he got the urge to kill some of them because they ridiculed him during sex or he was unable to satisfy them. And so they got upset with him. And so he decided in the moment to murder these women because of those things. You know, people later on would say that they were amazed at his lack of self-awareness, his lack of remorse, his lack of sympathy, his lack of any emotion at all. He just seemed to be kind of this robot who just did these things and felt that it was okay to do. In total, Joel Rifkin would go on trial for nine total women. Uh, they were not able, there were obviously women whose bodies they couldn't find. There were women that they couldn't exactly link to Joel, but the majority of them, they had a case against him. And so he would be convicted on nine counts nine additional counts of murder next to the Tiffany Bresciani one. So 10 in total, really. And he was sentenced to 203 years in prison. He will be eligible for parole when he is 238 years old. Um, I hope he has a good skin cream to look good at that age because it's a little, you're going to look a little rough. We'll look a little rough around there. There was a time, actually, believe it or not, where they suspected that Joel Rifkin may have also been Lisk, the Long Island serial killer, also known as the Gilgo Beach Killer, who was recently apprehended. When he was interviewed, the Long Island serial killer hadn't been caught yet. This was, he was interviewed years and years ago. And they asked him, like, do you think the Long Island serial killer is going to keep going? And he goes, yeah. He noticed that there was like a pattern in that the the guy would dispose of bodies in like threes or fours. And he said, that's what I did. I would dispose bodies three at a time because, uh, you know, because we like patterns. We're all about patterns. There were many clusters, uh, little you know, sets of three. Uh, three were dismembered. Three were in oil drums. Uh, some are in the water, some are on land. It's like my own little uh, nightmare scenario. It's creepy and weird, but, you know, he almost like idolized this Long Island serial killer that no one knew who it was back then. But the dude's a trip. The dude's an absolute trip. He is a nightmare of a person. Joel Rifkin currently enjoys his days at the Clinton Correctional Facility. And that's located in New York. So uh, he will die there. Uh, he will never, ever see the light of day again. And uh, good riddance to Joel Rifkin. Hopefully in some way, the his 17 victims are resting in peace and that their families have found a way to move on. But... That is it for this case. True crime, Arooney Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. Yeah, yeah, baby. Dingleberry Dongs. Gross. Uh, if you have tripped, fallen, and stumbled your way into this video, hello, I'm Mike. I tell true crime stories here on YouTube, so please subscribe. Give this video a like. Also, on the same day that I'm filming this video, I hit my 3 million follower mark over on TikTok. I've been doing my TikTok for about close to two and a half years. Uh, and I hit 3 million today, so that's really amazing. So if you don't uh, follow me there, I also tell short form true crime stories over there. Uh, it is linked in the link tree of this, in the description of this video below, if you want to follow me there as well. I do post um, monthly compilation videos though. So all the videos I post on TikTok um, each month, I'll post at the end of that month here on YouTube in gigantic compilation videos. But yeah, I also have a Discord server if you want to join it. It's in the link tree below. Be over the age of 18. If we find out you are not 18, uh, if you are younger, we will kick you out of there and ban you from it. I also sell merch, t-shirts, hoodies, that kind of thing. Also in the link tree below, we ship internationally. So yeah. Anyway, that's it. I'm going to stop yapping now and um, let you go about your day. So enjoy your day. Don't get serial killed, preferably. 
don't get murdered. <laughs> it's not funny, Mike. Idiot. Don't become a subject of one of my videos, please. Um, please don't. I beg of you to not do that. This is a fucking grim way to end a video. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> don't get murdered. Sound advice. Yeah. Sound advice, Mike. You idiot. Anyway, I'm going to sniff a marker now. And I'm crazy. So I... I'm not frozen. Did you think I was frozen? Probably thought I was frozen. You probably were smacking your computer like an idiot. Oh my god, shut up, Mike. End the video. Okay. Skimbop. That's also not how to say goodbye. Well, one day you'll learn. <laughs>